Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Act 1, Scene 7, Part 2. Um, so this is the period following Macbeth's soliloquy. As soon as Lady Macbeth enters, a series of interrogatives follow, uh, whether it's from Macbeth with, what news, have he asked for me? And then Lady Macbeth's, why have you left the chamber? No, you not he has. And both seem to convey that sense of uncertainty that indicates their level of concern, their level of anxiety regarding what they're about to do, what they're proposing. However, there is a difference between Macbeth's interrogatives and those of Lady Macbeth. Macbeth seems profoundly uncertain. What news? He doesn't know what's going on. Um, have he asked for me? Again, there's that uncertainty about uh, King Duncan's conduct, whereas Lady Macbeth is uncertain about Macbeth's behaviour. Um, she doubts his capacity to perform his function. Macbeth's following statement seems strong, powerful, determined. Following his soliloquy, he knows that um, he's not going to proceed in the business, another euphemism for killing the king. But the reasons he gives to Lady Macbeth are very different to those reasons that he gave in the soliloquy. And we know it's a convention of Elizabethan and Jacobean drama that what's said in soliloquy is the truth. So it's worth considering why he gives these different reasons to Lady Macbeth. Rather than telling Lady Macbeth about the potential dangers posed by committing regicide or how good a king King Duncan is, instead he focuses on the material. I've bought golden opinions from all sorts of people. You know, lots of people think great things about me. And I want to appreciate that. I want to enjoy all of this adulation that I'm receiving. Something that's much more selfish. And it seems as if the character of Macbeth recognises that that's something that Lady Macbeth would understand. Selfishness. A technique that Lady Macbeth frequently uses is to take an argument put forward by Macbeth and subverting it, turning it back against Macbeth. So that when in the previous lines Macbeth had said that he wished, wished to uh, wear his golden opinions, they should be worn now in their newest gloss, he's used a metaphor of clothing. And here she takes that conceit of clothing and turns it against him. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? When you dressed yourself previously, were you drunk? Was it not really you, but some kind of inflated bravado, some kind of boastful drunkenness that you dressed yourself in, that you gave the appearance of to the world? Um, and it's also worth linking that back to Act 1, Scene 3, where, where Macbeth himself says, why do you dress me in borrowed robes when he's told that he's Fane of Cawdor? So again, you get this metaphor of robes, things that are worn, being what you display to the world, the kind of um, representation of the self. So Lady Macbeth's essentially mocking and questioning Macbeth's faithfulness, his trustworthiness, by using this metaphor of drunkenness, that he didn't really mean what he was saying before when he expressed his ambitions to become king. Uh, was the hope drunk where you, you dressed yourself? Have it slept since? You know, have you slept since uh, exhibiting that drunkenness and now you've woken up with a hangover? He wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely. In other words, Macbeth's reflecting on that ambition that he articulated and is now exhibiting regret. She really exploits this by saying, from this time, such I account thy love. Uh, we know from the way that Shakespeare's presented Macbeth prior to this that he exhibits real love for his wife, and yet Lady Macbeth is questioning that. If he was willing to say that he would kill the king or was interested in becoming king previously, then is going against that, then can she trust what he's said about loving her? If he's said one thing and done another in regard to the king, is he saying one thing and doing another in terms of his love for her? So she's making him feel guilty. And she moves on from this to question his bravery. We know that Macbeth's bravery is a kind of defining characteristic of him. Brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name. And yet she says, art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Are you afraid to do what you want? So this questioning of his bravery is questioning his very essence. She then proceeds to say, wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, being the king, 
and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not waste lo- upon I would like the poor cat in the adage. In other words, you want to be king, but are you going to maintain the life of a coward, again questioning his bravery, by just accepting that you're not going to be king? Um, and this cat in the adage is a proverb that would have been well known at the time about a cat that sits staring at the water where the fish are that it wants to eat, but doesn't want to get its feet wet. Macbeth is metaphorically that cat. He doesn't want to get his feet wet. He doesn't want to get his hands bloody, according to Lady Macbeth, despite his desires. Macbeth responds to this as if under attack, you know, privy peace and defends himself with, I dare do all that may become a man, who dares do more is none. In other words, he would do anything that any human being would do, that any man would do, and it's this notion of masculinity that's important to him. Who dares do more is none, suggests that if anybody would do more than he would do, they're not human, they're not civilized, they're bestial. Again, Lady Macbeth takes this notion that Macbeth has put forward and turns it against him. Um, given that he says that he will do anything that a man will do, she says, well, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? So essentially, she's suggesting that if he's claiming that he would do anything that a man would do, then it must have been a beast. It must have been an animal or something that suggested this to her. Uh, Again, questioning his very manliness. When you durst do it, when you dare to do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be much more the man. In other words, if you became king, you'd be even more of a man. You'd be even more attractive to her. Macbeth's determination and conviction is questioned still further through this reference to nor time nor place did then a deer, and yet you would make both. In other words, at the time when Macbeth was talking about the potential to become king or to kill the king, it wasn't the right time or place, and yet he was talking about doing it. And then now that those times and places have made themselves, they're the right time and the right place, they are fit, it doth or make you. You know, that Macbeth is now saying, oh no, I'm not going to kill the king, I'm not going to become king even though circumstances are entirely right for that enterprise. The final persuasive blow dealt by Lady Macbeth is to suggest that Macbeth's determination is in stark contrast to hers. While Macbeth showed no determination in going through with the uh, killing of Duncan, she says that if she had offered to do something like this, then she would have absolutely continued to do so. And she gives this example of, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. In other words, she has breastfed a child and she would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. Now, one of the things we need to bear in mind is that later in Act 4, Scene 3, Macduff says he has no children, suggesting that um, Lady Macbeth's child died at some point. If that's the case, then this perhaps seems even more powerful an image. She's talking about their dead child and saying that the most nurturing moment, the most loving moment, the most tender moment of breastfeeding a child, that moment of connectedness, at that moment she would have dashed the child's brains out if she'd sworn to do so. And notice it's not just killed, this is incredibly emotive, violent language. Dashed the brains out has connotations of absolute destruction and its destruction of an innocent, which is reinforced by the boneless gums and the smiling. This is a child, a baby that's got complete trust in its mother, and yet Lady Macbeth would commit a terrible act like this if she'd committed to do so. The contrast with Macbeth is profound, and she's showing the depth of her determination, essentially showing up Macbeth for his lack of that determination, and this is ultimately what convinces him to go through with the act of killing Duncan. The conviction that we saw in Macbeth following his soliloquy has clearly been destroyed, as he says, if we should fail. Uh, This conditional that he doesn't even conclude demonstrates his acceptance of Lady Macbeth's persuasion. He's going to kill Duncan, or aim to kill Duncan. 
And Lady Macbeth merely rejects it with, we fail. Or in some editions, a question mark follows it rather than the exclamation. Um, either we fail, as in, well, at least we've tried it, or we fail, as if that's not really possible. There's a belief that's expressed by Lady Macbeth that uh, they will not fail if Macbeth is able to screw his courage to the sticking place. A metaphor probably linking to weaponry, uh, most notably a crossbow, but it could also be a reference to a musical instrument. Either way, it's the idea that the courage can be secured. If the courage can be screwed down, if it can be determined, then they will not fail. It's worth noting that what follows is Lady Macbeth's plan for the murder of Duncan. She's the one that's taken the initiative with this. She's the one that's leading the murder of Duncan. The plan is wholly hers, and all that Beth has to do is essentially execute the final stage of it. Notions of masculinity are evident again in what Macbeth says in response to Lady Macbeth. He says that she should bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Essentially a reference to the fact that her characteristics, her metal, are such that she is masculine. She is full of determination, resolve, uh, violence, and all of those qualities that have been evident in what she's said so far. To the point where he doesn't believe that she should give birth to a daughter. Um, those characteristics should be passed down only to a male child. So we've gone from a position where at the end of the soliloquy, Macbeth is resolved not to kill Duncan. We will proceed no further in this business. To a position where he says, I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. He's resolved to murder Duncan. And clearly it's the intervention of Lady Macbeth that's led to this change in resolve, to, that's led to such an enormous change in Macbeth. And then we get this crucial final point. Away and mock the time with fairest show, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. It's again a reference to to beguile the time, look like the time that we saw in Act 1, Scene 5, and also look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. This theme of deceit, deception, uh, presenting a false face to the world is one that runs throughout the play. The parallelism in the final line is also interesting uh, because the false face is clearly a mask. It's not the true representation of the individual's feelings. It's what they wish to re represent to the external world, while the heart is the true feeling, the true character of that individual. Um, so while you have false in terms of a misrepresentation of the face, you have false heart as in a lack of loyalty, uh, the disingenuous uh, subject that Macbeth recognises himself to be in attempting to murder Duncan. Okay, tough.